Okay, I think it's time for us to try to get started. For me to five here, his co-director. Thank you all for coming. Um, this panel is going to be about the legacy of the Tuskegee Syphilis Study in the research settings. And we have esteemed panelists. Um, we have Robin Diaz, who is Chief Legal Counsel for St. Jude Research Hospital. Uh, next, we have Jane Hankins, who is an associate member of the St. Jude Faculty Department of Hematology. And then we have uh, Patricia Matthews Juarez, who is the co-director for the Research Center for Health Disparities, Equity, and the Exposome, and Professor, Department mm -hmm. of Preventative mm -hmm. Medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center. And then we have Latrice Pichon, who is Assistant Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the School of Public Health here at the University of Memphis. Thank you so much, ladies, for coming. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start with um, Robin. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my task is to, in about 10 minutes, walk you through um, the legal and ethical background on clinical research so that all of these ladies to my right can then talk about the work that, that they do in the present day in clinical research. And so, um, forgive me, I'm going to have to move fairly quickly on this. Uh, but before we can talk about the present day, I think we need to talk a little bit about the history um, and, and even what happened before Tuskegee. So it's important to understand first that in the 19th and early 20th centuries in, in this country, much of what we now think of as clinical research was, well, it was entirely unregulated. Um, it was conducted in charity wards and in public hospitals for the large part. And so it was historically conducted on the poor, on orphans, on um, convicts, on prostitutes. And so that, that is where it all started. Um, the first time we got close to regulation in this area um, was really after the Nazi-led studies and um, the, Nur the Nuremberg tribunals. So there were about 7,000 prisoners uh, who were forced into being research participants. And they, were, they had pharmaceuticals forced upon them to see what the effects of those pharmaceuticals would be. Um, they were gassed so that then we could see what the results of that were um, and what various antidotes would look like. And so as part of the Nuremberg trial and the, and the aftermath of the Nuremberg trial, the Nuremberg Code was developed in the late 1940s. And that was really a catalyst for looking at the principles of ethics in clinical research. So that was where there was really the first discussion of voluntary informed consent being essential. Um, that, that subjects could terminate their involvement in research, that there had to be some sort of a risk versus benefit analysis done with respect to the participant themselves and not necessarily just a societal risk versus benefit, um, that, that experiments should be done for the good of society and were possible based on prior animal studies, not testing human beings first. Um, that physical and mental harm to human beings should be avoided, and that only scientifically, scientifically qualified individuals should be conducting clinical research. So after that, uh, there was actually something that is now well known but wasn't known for many years called the Guatemala study. Uh, and it's something that we all learned about within the last few years through archival research. And that involved US Public Health Service um, physicians, including John Cutler, who was later involved in Tuskegee. Uh, and they went to Guatemala and intentionally infected about 700 Guatemalans with go gonorrhea, cancroid, and syphilis. Uh, they used vulnerable populations. It was Guatemalan sex workers, prisoners, soldiers, and hospitalized psychiatric patients. And the researchers were seeking to determine whether administering penicillin following intercourse could prevent the spread of STDs. Uh, there was a lack of informed consent. There was coercion. Uh, the researchers provided cigarettes to subjects in order to obtain their compliance. And remember, some of these were inmates or, or people in psychiatric facilities. Uh, there was deception. The Guatemalan mental asylum officials were led to believe that the inocula were actually treatment drugs 
and not active STDs that were being um, inserted into these research participants. And again, all this was just recently discovered by someone who did research in archives and found this out, uh, and the U.S. government became involved, has since issued an apology, and um, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bio Bioethical Issues was tasked with investigating this and issued a report. So we are still learning about some of the things that happened um, at the same time that the Tuskegee study was going on. Um, after all of this, that study happened 1946 to 1948, so actually overlapped with Tuskegee. Uh, while Tuskegee was still going on, there was the Declaration of Helsinki, which, in which it was determined that the interests of the research subject should be given higher priority than the overall interests of society, and that every subject should receive the best known treatment. So again, kind of ironic, all of this is happening at the same time as Tuskegee, um, but Tuskegee continues as it did. Uh, we've talked a lot about Tuskegee this morning. It's important then to understand what the legacy of Tuskegee was from a, a regulatory perspective and an ethical perspective. So as one of the speakers mentioned this morning, after Tuskegee in 1974, the United States Congress passed the National Research Act which um, established an IRB system for regulation of human subjects research. Um, it, it also established a commission that later developed the Belmont Report. And the Belmont Report was developed in 1978, and it really set forth three guiding principles that are still used in clinical research today. One is respect for persons. So persons are, on t are autonomous. Um, persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to special protections. Persons have to be able to give informed consent, not be coerced, uh, be free to drop out of research if they choose to. The next is beneficence, so do no harm. Uh, min maximize possible benefits, minimize the risks of, of research. And the third is justice, treat people fairly, consider who receives the benefits of research and who bears the burdens. And those principles from the Belmont Report are incorporated into the Common Rule, which is part of uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. It, for those of you who are lawyers or law students, uh, it's at 45 CFR Part 46. And um, the, the Code of Federal Reg Regulations deal with clinical research and the Common Rule through four different subparts. Subpart A is the, the basic ethical standards and regulatory requirements that apply to all clinical research in this country. So again, criteria for, for IRB approval, criteria for proper informed consent, documentation of proper informed consent. And then there are three other subparts that deal with um, special populations. So subpart B is for pregnant women, subpart C is prisoners, and subpart D is for children. Any research done on those particular populations you have to go through special considerations. Uh, vulnerable populations are also addressed at 45 CFR 46.111, and that includes not just those populations that I just mentioned, but some others like economically disadvantaged or ed educationally disadvantaged per persons. Uh, and in those cases, you need some additional safeguards in place to make sure that you're protecting the interests of those individuals, and you need to think about those. Um, another legacy of Tuskegee, while not necessarily mandated in regulations, is that it's now commonplace to think about the ethics of group harm when you're doing clinical research, to think about what group of people are you dealing with and have they historically suffered? Will this research contribute to that historic suffering? Um, have they had less access to education, to social services, to health care, um, such as underserved or poor populations? Uh, would they be behaviorally or politically stigmatized, such as if you were doing research on commercial sex workers, which has happened a lot in the past, if you were doing research on injection drug users? Uh, and, and so to take all of that into account and really focus on whether or not the research you're doing benefits not just the individuals but that population and whether it causes more harm to that popu population overall to do the research. And that's really important. The, the discussion of group, group harms and, and discussion at the level of the Institutional Review Board, at whatever institution that the research is taking place at, to help make sure that we have the trust in place that was really damaged by Tuskegee and other studies. 
if you don't have that trust in place, you're not going to have the research participants willing to engage in research. So that's my, I hope, 10 minute <laughs> overview for you. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hankins. All right. That was a <laughs> whirlwind <laughs> 10 minutes. Yeah, it's great. Um, so I am a pediatric hematologist at St. Jude, and um, I'm pedi a trained pediatric hemonc, but I don't do oncology. Uh, I I, ch I chose to do benign hematology, and most of what I do is care for children with sickle cell disease, which is, um, for those who are not familiar, is a genetic disease that affects the function of the hemoglobin, that carries oxygen, so there are lots of consequences from not having a normal hemoglobin in the body. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, the, one of the vital proteins that we have, so if you don't carry oxygen around well, then it's a problem, right? So the, one of the hallmarks of having sickle cell disease is this hemoglobin, um, it glues to other hemoglobins inside the red cell, deforms the shape of the red cell, that red cell then doesn't circulate well, and there are many other thousands and thousands of red cells that look the same, and they don't circulate well, and they ended up clogging the circulation. So that impairs blood flow, oxygenation. And one of the main things that uh, patients with sickle cell disease have is pain because of the lack of this blood flow. But that's not the only thing and probably uh, not really the main thing that we should be focusing on sickle cell disease. Truly what it is over time is that a chronic disease with chronic damage of several organs in the body because of this constant lack of oxygenation to the brain, to the lungs, to the heart. So over time, people with sickle cell disease develop uh, end organ damage. So you know, kidneys won't work well, brain won't work well, the brain will not work well. So it is a disease that with progressive degeneration over time, and today we are looking at uh, the median survival uh, for the most severe type of sickle cell disease is in the mid-40s. So we are still losing a lot of people with sickle cell disease at a young age when they're still productive. And uh, so there's a lot of things that we have to do to uh, not only improve um, life expectancy, but also how they are living, so the quality of life of people living with sickle cell disease. So our program at St. Jude is for pediatric patients. We see kids from 0 to 18 years of age. And we have uh, a very large program that developed over time. And um, I am inc incredibly fortunate to work at St. Jude because we have um, the ability to provide all the resources in terms of you know, technology, equipment, and personnel that I think makes um, all the difference. When you have a trained staff that understands the disease and, um, and they're dedicated to treating people with sickle cell disease, so we have some of those here in the audience, two of the educators in our group, so you really can provide this 360 degree uh, care, so you're not only looking at you know, what's happening to the function of the kidney, but you're looking at how the kid's doing at school, uh, if the kid's having depression, how I'm addressing the depression, the interplay between depression and the disease. So you really need um, an army of people uh, who know how to take care of sickle cell disease. And, um, and as I said, uh, we need to really continue making improvements um, in the care of sickle cell disease because we've made good progress over the, few de over the last few decades. Um, we um, are not, our kids are not expected to die anymore. So if you look at the survival for children with sickle cell disease in the United States today, it's 99%. 99.5 percent, which is a huge improvement from, say, 30 years ago, uh, in which the survival was in the 80 percent range, 70 percent range. So we've made huge progress, but the adults are dying early, and they're still living with chronic uh, organ disease. So um, we've done, made progress through the research and improvement in care that we provide the patients. There's still a lot to do, and I would say um, a lot we still have to do with the children, but a lot with the adults. I would say there's probably the, the population that needs the most attention with sickle cell disease at this point. And um, one of the things that I think is key for doing research um, in sickle cell disease, and I think any other um, population in which you don't have good access to care, is that fix your clinical care, F fix your clinical clinical infrastructure. And one of the things that um, we've learned through the years, uh, and that's part of how you develop the trust 
uh, with the, the population that you're trying to do research with is that you have to provide excellence in care. And then once you do that, then you can layer the research on top of it. So I think it's a mistake that, um, that people think you can just go in and provide uh, research when you don't, for chronic disease, when you're not really thinking, uh, you know, first I'll take care of the, you know, the patients, fix the access to care, and then I can layer the research on top of it. So it's only then that you can develop this trust relationship that then when you approach for research, then um, I think we have um, a uh, better response. And just to give you an example, I think uh, um, at St. Jude, we have a, a, one of the highest rates of participation in research for um, non -observation, for observational studies. So I'm not testing a new drug, a new device. Uh, I'm just you know, asking to observe something, you know, do an observation or a blood test to look at something in the lab. So our rate of participation when we come to clinic to the family to say, hey, would you allow your child to participate in the study, we go over the informed consent, it's something like 85, 90% of the family say yes, I would allow my, my child to be on this um, research study. For interventional studies, so now I'm testing a new drug, there are risks and benefits with that, um, then uh, the rates of participation range, depending on the complexity of the, of the trial, between 30 and 50%, which is pretty good still. So, um, and I think that's the result of years of um, developing and improving our clinical uh, care enterprise and uh, provide, providing this excellence in care. So that's why I think there's this uh, an immense amount of trust from the families that allow their children to be on studies. And, and, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, there's benefits. Sometimes there's no, no, not a whole lot of benefit in this. She'll say, yeah, and it takes extra time, extra visits, and extra blood draws. So, so it's inc incredible benevolence from um, this, the families and, and the patients. So because they see, it, I think they see the greater benefit. So it may not benefit my child, but may benefit, you know, the next generation of kids with sickle cell disease. So, and I think they see that it's part of uh, the education that we do in our clinic. We provide care and uh, educate about the disease, and we educate about the importance of research. Um, so, um, and then what do we have in terms of what's new, and then what are we developing? And um, uh, we have. We have a lot of trials, but I think the exciting things that are in the horizon uh, would be um, uh, new gene therapy trials that we're hoping to uh, further develop in the lab that we can translate into the clinic that we hope will provide um, cure for sickle cell disease. Uh, and um, I think that's uh, something that will be, um, if it works, and so it will be uh, what will probably would be the thing that we can look forward in the next uh, couple of decades that may provide cure for a, a larger section of uh, the population with sickle cell disease. Um, and um, I think uh, uh, I was thinking this morning when um, I heard the, the, the talks and, um, and I had prepared other uh, talking points which I, I completely changed my mind because I think uh, what I live today is truly the legacy of Tuskegee. Uh, when I, I go, um, when I consent a patient for a, a study, and I go over the informed consent, and you know they're pretty long, they're 20 pages long, depending on the complexity of the study, 30 pages long. I have to have a witness. Um, I have to have an ombudsman. Uh, to well, sometimes I need two signatures: the mother and the father. And uh, if, especially if there's no uh, direct benefit, if there's more risk and benefit. But I think uh, the meat of it, uh, of the informed consent, is really going over in detail uh, on uh, over the balance of the risk and benefit. That's what we spend so much time today. And then, uh, and, and, and it, it's funny because. It's, it, it's a long process, sometimes it takes an hour, hour and a half, and, uh, but it, it gave me so much more respect now for the, the hour, hour and a half that takes me away from the clinic to spend the time with the, the families and discussing those risks and benefits after hearing the h historic background and why we do this today. Uh, and it's, it's so important. And sometimes I hear families say, hey, can we skip that part? Can we skip that part? And then it really can't, you know. You, I guess your signature at the end it needs to be reflective of your understanding of the risks and benefits. So I guess we live today the legacy of 
Tuskegee, and uh, and I think it's just the extra care and um, uh, the extra amount of um, being careful and to continue the trust relationship that I think we uh, developed with our population. Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, staying and listening to this panel. Um, I knew Mary Hopper, who was one of the last surviving nurses of the Tuskegee study. And I met her in 1997 when uh, we were asked, when I was asked to participate uh, in the group that the President of the United States had charged Donna Shalala with pulling together to talk about how do we protect against these atrocities. Tuskegee, and I want to correct the term, it's now called the United States Public Health Service Syphilis Study because the Bioethics uh, Center and Tuskegee have taken, um, I suppose, a, a, a position that it was not Tuskegee who did it, it was the United States government that did it. Now, there are several studies like Tuskegee. Uh, Tuskegee is number three on a list of 10 studies. Uh, the one that we don't talk about a lot is the one that was conducted at Johns Hopkins with Hen Henrietta Lacks, in which we're dealing with the HeLo cells now and the problems that uh, we have countered in uh, clinical trials and, uh, and informed, lack of informed consent. One of the things that uh, the President of the United States did at that time they brought people together in a room, and that's where I met Mary Stark Hopper. She had come to Tuskegee as the nurse to Carver. She was born in 1919, and she died in uh, 2006. And I had the privilege of meeting her and working with her from 2000 to 2006 on a committee. Now, one of the things that is fascinating to me uh, Dr. Hankins asked the question this morning, did any of the nurses know that they were participating in the study and what they were doing? Mary says she did not know. She was a volunteer. She was told to give some uh, injections, to give some medication, and she felt so badly about it that she would sometime cook sweet potato pies for them. Now, if you are interested in that kind of history, please go and, and, and look at uh, the life and times of, of Mary uh, Hopper. I say that because we want to put a face to people who work and research because Mary was one of several people that we, we may paint with a broad brush that we were all doing something wrong. Now, let's get back to the issue of uh, what we do now. What we do now, we probably st still have some missteps relative to what we do in research. Because there is still a lack of oversight uh, that we need to be aware of, and it is the integrity of the researcher. It is the trust of the community that they, they, they bring to a clinical trial or they bring to a drug trial. And it is important that as the, test, as the public health study has sort of led us to know that the IRB, the consent form should be clear, it should be printed in language that people understand. Individuals who are poor and who are uneducated do not read uh, above a third grade. They don't even understand above a third grade level, and I'm not being uh, putting people down. A number of, of us have looked at health literacy and number C as a part of the concept of what people understand. A 20-page IRB to someone who doesn't know how to read, who cannot understand the the context of it sometimes is problematic. So we have moved towards simplifying uh, the informed consent form. And as Dr. Hankins has in indicated, there are individuals who are in, in the room that will help uh, 
deal with that, whether it is in the language of the individual who is being uh, included in the study, Hispanic, um, black, because we are all born in this country, uh, uh, do not always mean that we understand the language. And I deal with that from the perspective of looking at cultural, cultural competency across the board uh, from Appalachia uh, and across uh, the United States. So one of the things that is really important as we, we look at this is to, uh, and the federal government has sort of moved its thinking so that now not only do you have institutions with strong IRBs, you have communities, uh, tribal colleges with IRBs, and their role is to protect the individual and to get the community involved. If you have a study and it's all African Americans or it's all Hispanics and all Native Americans, you really should get individuals involved that look like the population that you're going to study on the IRB. And that's really a part of what uh, Dr. Uh, Loria Diaz was talking about when she introduced the idea of the look at uh, uh, the patient should look like the person uh, in the study, the IRB. We also, also, what Mary did, she worked for four presidents. Uh, she worked for Bush, and she worked for Clinton. She also worked for Reagan, and she worked for Carter. And she served on several committees. And what she did, uh, she went on to be a great woman because she began to say, we must protect individuals with uh, informed consent. And so I'll close by saying that we, we have to have community engagement. What we do is called community based participatory research. We have people inform us as to what they think. We have people inform us about what they, they not only what the question ought to be, but what, how we should be guided in that kind of study. We also, uh, when we have a database of 30,000 variables that is collected from across the country uh, through all kinds of databases, and one of the things that if we get personal data, it's automatically de-identified. In the state and across the United States now, if someone collects, especially CDC, collects a database and it has less than 20 people in it, you don't get that information. So there's a real effort to to not to prevent what happened uh, in Tuskegee. And the last thing is that we need to continue to strengthen uh, research for uh, uh, strengthen researchers' training and bioethics. I end it there, and thank you for the. <laughs> okay, well, I think thank you for um, the invitation to come here to present today. Um, I think that was a nice segue for some of the research approaches that I use, um, which has to do with CBPR. So I was trained in the Kellogg Health Scholars Program um, on the application of CBPR. Um, and what that means is it's a research <laughs> approach, it's not a method that equitably involves community from in all phases of the research process, from conceptualizing the project, coming up with a research question, um, and being involved in the data collection, interpretation of the data, and then finally dissemination of the research findings. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work on a project um, as an evaluator um, looking at um, how HIV has been addressed in African American churches um, in Flint, Michigan, which kind of has become another interest of mine while I'm working here in the Mid-South to kind of explore how the faith community is involved in addressing HIV. And then also another arm is just, again, using this approach, CBPR, to um, work with community-based agencies um, to address HIV disparities here in the Mid-South. And so to kind of um, orient you to these principles, um, there are eight principles involved in CBPR. And I'm not going to go over all of them, but some of the, the ones that I think are really important is building on the strengths and um, resources within the community. Um, this is a co-learning process, so it's not that I'm, as a researcher, trying to tell communities how to conduct business. Um, it's a co-learning process where I'm learning from the community about some of the historical underpinnings or contextual factors that may play a role in the lack of community engagement in research. So. Um, 
it's and and the importance of it disseminating this information um, not just in scientific journals but in other platforms that can reach the community um, and one of the things that has happened over the course of I guess um, HIV research research is um, one that the the Surgeon General has come out with a this is in 2001 came out with a sexual health report and follow up to that is national HIV AIDS strategy and both of them call on all sectors um, of the community including the faith-based community to be involved in um, these efforts to address HIV um, and I was, we were tasked to talk a little bit about the barriers to meaningful research engagement and I think one big barrier is being an outsider. I am not from this community. I'm from California. I did not grow up in the Mid-South and um, just also another barrier to engagement is just understanding some of the contextual factors and how we address sexuality here in the Mid-South. Um, issues around sexual risk behavior, stigma, and and then more of a practical issue, how agencies that do this work um, are also competing for some of the resources um, in order to provide services to HIV positive um, individuals. And so how we define community, that really varies. Um, I like how you said the community should look like, you know, the people or the, the, the community should represent the people that you know you're studying and then that community should also be involved in the research process. So community, um, you know, serves as gatekeepers. They can be partnering organizations, HIV service providers. Um, they're skilled and knowledgeable about what is going on in the community, and they protect the community. These are credible people that, um, in, in this case, our HIV clients um, trust. And I think what has been the fact that, so we're also been asked to kind of talk about best practices. So CPPR, using this as an approach, has been, um, helpful in the sense that it is aligned with the national HIV AIDS strategy, but then also it has been helpful for me as an outsider to kind of um, be introduced into the community and building off of the relationships that have already been established here. And then I also am building relationships with some of the partnering um, agencies that do this work. And, I, and I'd like to give credit to several organizations here um, in Memphis. St. Jude um, has a HIV coalition, it's Connect to Protect Memphis, which, ha which has lots of different stakeholders that sit on this coalition to address HIV. Um, the faith-based community has also been involved through Church Health Center. There's a project called the Ephraim Project. Um, we have a variety of churches in this community that do HIV testing on-site in the church. They support and observe national um, awareness events such as National Black HIV AIDS Day, um, World AIDS Day. Um, I also want to give credit to the Memphis Ryan White Part A program who has released um, in partnership with pastors and other um, community partners an HIV toolkit that can be used um, in churches to raise awareness um, among the congregations about this epidemic and how it's affecting our communities, particularly here in the Mid-South. And then finally, um, Shelby County Health Department, um, the EPI section, who I've had um, a great, again, all of these have been great partners in terms of moving the research agenda forward. Um, we have been able to not only do the um, needs assessment for the Memphis area um, for our HIV patients, but then also, um, doing other pilot projects where we were assessing HIV outreach needs among our homeless um, adults here in Memphis. And so I guess there are, you know, certainly some advantages and benefits of using a, um, CBPR as an approach um, to conduct research and to, again, increase community engagement. Um, it increases resources for the communities that are involved in the research process. I have seen in cases where community-based organizations um, are the lead agency for um, for grants. They are the fiduciary. They receive the funds. I've also seen mechanisms that have come out, and we have applied for them in partnership with um, our um, partners. Um, mechanisms coming through the Office of Women's Health that particularly address um, needs that have to do with like doing faith-based research. Um, and then also through the National Center for Minority Health Disparities, there have been mechanisms um, to conduct CBPR research or to use CBPR as an approach to um, addressing health disparities research. Um, 
I think this approach also, it enhances the relevance of the data. So when you have collected these data and have involved communities um, from in all phases of the process, um, you're more likely to see this um, unfold in the community where, you know, you have um, partners that are more inclined to implement interventions, um, test programs, and then also make some kind of policy changes within their organization. And I'll say that there are some challenges with um, this approach um, in terms of time constraints um, for both individuals, whether that be the researchers as well as community partners, just having different time demands. Um, I can speak for myself as an academic um, dealing with issues related to tenure and promotion um, and how that always is not aligned with using this approach. Um, and then also some of the RFAs or RFPs that come out um, the, the, these funding mechanisms are earmarked for certain health disparities and sometimes that's not the um, issue that has been identified by the community and so as a partnership you have to kind of think about how you're going to work through that. But some of the lessons learned, do I have more time? Okay, some of the lessons that I've learned is to, um, to work with highly regarded CBOs that the community respects. Um, to build on the history of positive working relationships in the community. And I don't think it's, um, it behooves us to focus on these barriers all the time. It's really important to think about the assets and strengths that this community has. And Memphis has a lot of them, irrespective of what some people may believe. Um, and then I think I mentioned this before, but taking the historical um, and contextual factors into account, particularly when we're talking about HIV, being mindful of um, church doctrine, how you address sexuality, and other um, sensitive topics. And then finally, one thing that I would recommend for all of us that are engaged in the research process is to make sure that you involve your community in the dissemination of research findings so that they have opportunities to co-author, um, to present this information at a local, regional level, but then also to participate in disseminating these findings um, at scientific conferences, which, you know, kind of increases the sense of um, ownership in terms of, like, the data. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. I was intrigued by the discussion about the, uh, the important consent forms. I think those of us in the room who are attorneys are very aware of the conflict between our desire to cover every possible eventuality um, and, and put a lot of extra clauses and sentences so we can make sure that no one can sue us for malpractice. Uh, and the tension between that and having a legible document, uh, and particularly in this case, a document that's legible not to another attorney, but to a lay person, particularly one who uh, who may not have the same educational level. So I guess my question is, first of all, how in, in the healthcare community do y'all uh, address that tension? And then as, because I've also seen that these consent forms are getting longer and longer, um, have we gone too far in that direction? Have we gotten to a point where, just like the mortgage contract, nobody is capable <laughs> of reading it? Uh, I guess I'll start from from the hospital perspective it, it's interesting the, the lawyers actually don't write the consent forms um, that are used in study it's it's the principal investigator who drafts the consent form and then that goes before the Institutional Review Board, which is a large group comprised of a, a, a number of different people, including community representatives mm -hmm. and a patient ombuds person who will ultimately be the person who's responsible along with the principal investigator for sitting down with the patient or the family and making sure that they understand it. We do have an attorney who sits on the Institutional Review Board um, and so looks at all of that along with the rest of the IRB members and might pick up on things that are problems. but. Um, there, there's such an in-depth process. The regulations are actually so complex um, and so numerous now that the, the IRB and the, the Office of Human Subjects Protection within any hospital, are, they're very well aware of what their requirements are, and it's kind of a self-regulating machine. Um, you might be able to better address mm -hmm. how that comes, any of you, how, how that, that looks from the family's perspective or even how, how it looks from the, the PI's perspective. 
Well, when we work with the uh, informed consent, we bring people together uh, as a PI. We bring them together and talk about what is the aspect of the research. Uh, how can we best explain it? And we get a community folk to tell us uh, exactly how you would end up saying it. For instance, uh, in Appalachia, uh, the word uh, urinate um, or peeing uh, e equal making water. So you've got to really begin to think about who you, your target audience is and to bring them into that process as well. And that way you get a very clean and clear IRB. IRBs are now being used as defense to, uh, to cases of litigation. And you really don't want that. You really want people to know what the benefit and, and risk are uh, that are contained within their participation because their participation is for better health. It's not for uh, getting money from a, a research gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna briefly answer your question. Um, so I think one of the keys, too, is um, give the, uh, the participants time to process the information. So uh, sometimes it takes two, three, discussion sessions mm -hmm. until they're ready to sign. Sometimes they're never ready to sign. But one of the things that I, I do is I uh, give an FYI consent, so it looks exactly like the real consent, except for the participant's name is not printed on the consent. So I give a copy of it and then let them go home. And, and sometimes that's very helpful because they go home and they read and discuss with family, other people, and they come back. Sometimes they have specific questions, but um, I, I, I see your point. I mean, I, I don't like when I get to that point of the consent that talks about uh, uh, if uh, there is harm due to the research and who is mm -hmm. responsible. I mean, I really don't like that part, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I go over it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, there's tension when we get to that point, yes, because it reminds us that it can fail, you know, the research may go terribly wrong, you know, toxicity can happen from whatever we are testing here. So I guess it reminds me that it may go terribly wrong and the patient that he's taking a huge risk at signing that consent. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's no way around really. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you had a question. No, I was going to make a comment, been an educated person, a lawyer as well, and have had a child who had to go to St. Jude and treat through St. Jude. On the other side, I think that uh, Dr. Matthews hit on a thing. The researcher needs to be trustworthy yeah. and gone through the process by setting an attorney, irrespective of the consent form. The consent form can be 50 pages long. I, mean, I was educated. I basically didn't know what I was reading. My wife is an RN and went through the process. At the time, it was an emotional thing down there with my child. And you basically, I would have signed anything mm -hmm. because I was relying on the researcher and what he or she was standing in front of me because I wanted help mm -hmm. at the moment. <clears throat> and I wasn't hearing necessarily what the form of the researcher was saying, but what the repercussions could be. Nor was I reading with intensity the form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's somewhere there's a, a balance, and you can't hide behind that form, and the researcher or the hospital can't hide behind that form. Mm -hmm. And time was a essence in some of these instances to make a decision and not wait around two, three, four days mm -hmm. for treatment. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so there is a dilemma and I think the researcher has to be honest. I think the burden is on the researcher to be more honest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than the phone. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think that that's what we got to Right. The community has got the force. I agree. Right. So, on 
the hospital. Yeah, your point is very well taken. Yeah. Sometimes we have time to, you know, two, three, five, four days a week to, to, to think about do I want to be, but sometimes there's no time, you know, depending on, you know, if it's an acute condition and we have to start treatment. So you're absolutely correct. But I think it goes back to um, if, um, I, if, if there's a sense that I, my child can receive excellence in care regardless of being in this research or not, I think that is, you know, very, I think that very comforting and I think will make the, the family, um, I guess, more comfortable to participate. Uh, I guess the, the challenge is when you don't know the participant at all, say, so, you know, a child walks in with cancer, right, and then I have no prior relationship with that family, with that, with a child, and, and now I, I have to begin a treatment and, and then approach the family that day, say, you want to participate in research. I think, I think that's a huge challenge, and it's a huge burden on the investigator, you're right. Um, I mean, I had, situa I had situations and I had uh, to approach families to participate in randomized clinical trial phase three that you randomize to the drug or to a placebo. And uh, in my mind, uh, there was an equipause pause for that particular participant because I thought that he could benefit from the drug and I didn't approach. I didn't approach because I, I, I felt the huge burden that, you know, what if this child you know, ended up randomized to the placebo arm, never received the drug, and I think there might be a slight benefit that, for this child. So I think it's a huge burden on the investigator, and then uh, and, and those decisions of should I approach or not should be part of that too. We spend a lot of time <clears throat> doing health disparity research. We look at chronic disease, and now we're looking at the what are the causes. We've spent 30 years and none of the causes have gotten better, whether it's breast cancer, whether it's cardiovascular, whatever it is. And we are thinking, maybe it's the epigenetic, it's the environment, the, the stressors, the switchers, and what are they? And so one of the things that <clears throat> we have started to do, and there's a new, new funding source out there, patient-centered um, research, and we try really, really hard to get people to come and talk to us. And we try hard, and when we structure comparative effectiveness uh, models, we try hard to figure out do no harm. And we don't even think about this concept of placebo if the person is in a trial that is a plus or minus. We think everyone should get everything. So there's this ethics piece that, that researchers really need to struggle with. And be honest, we can't help your child in 30 minutes. We can't help them in a year. This is what we need to say. We need to say, here are the benefits. And emotionally, I understand that. It's difficult. And when it gets down to clinical trials where we're trying to enroll African-American women on breast cancer uh, uh, trials, and they think that they're going to get better as a consequence of it, and they're already stage four. We need to be honest about that as researchers. And so I agree with you. Uh, it is the integrity of the researcher and the honesty, and it got to be in words that people understand. Stephen? Mm -hmm. so that the people in Memphis who deal with a particular population 
would also be capable of being trained for a population like Appalachia, where mm -hmm. they have similar socioeconomic mm -hmm. uh, issues, but maybe not as much racial mm -hmm. or other historical issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are training programs, and the, I, the Office of Sponsored Programs put them on uh, the IRB uh, leadership in each, of the, in each of the schools. There's a real push now for being culturally competent, and there, there's integration of, of what you should and should not do in basic uh, medical education. The Liaison Committee on Medical Education defines it. Uh, they, they put you into situations where you have to respond in a different way. And there are organizations all across the country, including NIH, that you can participate in relative to uh, the do's and don'ts. The, the one quick thing I would add to that is that in, in the hospital, if you're doing research in a hospital setting, you're also subject to oh, right. the requirements of, the, of yes. the accrediting body. So the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services, and, and the Joint Commission, which is the right. accrediting body. And the Joint Commission focuses very heavily on cultural competence, and so there are mm -hmm. a lot of things that have to be done from that perspective, asking right away lots of questions about, mm -hmm. that get to those issues, that get to language issues. Mm -hmm. um, but sure, it's still a challenge. If you've got to make that yeah. decision, if you've got to have that conversation in 30 minutes and you know, a family just got a diagnosis and they are stunned and, and they're still trying to get their heads around that diagnosis. I don't, I, there's no panacea, right? It's just um, you know, trying, to, trying to understand it from their perspective, trying to have a dialogue and, and make sure that they're understanding what you're saying to them. I think that, you know, there's a lot of focus now on, on that give and take. Can you repeat back to me what I just said? Um, really, really trying to get at it, pl places where they may not understand. Well, that is not a research question. Uh, you're really talking about uh, uh, what is the medical um, um, complement of, of physicians in a community that might, uh, you know, we've looked at uh, the fact that in the African American community here, there's a maldistribution of primary care docs. And you need to have a primary doc to get to a specialist. So if there's misdiagnosis or mis interpretation of what the illness is, uh, I would recommend that the person goes, uh, uh, go back to if they have insurance, and very often they don't have insurance, that they at least contact uh, uh, the Shelby County Health Department or some other uh, service that would recommend, I see you shaking your head, uh, recommend, yeah, recommend a second opinion. Uh, and very often the, the you know, that can happen. So I, I would recommend that uh, you contact the primary care doctor's office again at, for, for a second opinion or the Shepherd County Health Department. Okay. All right. Thank you. Or the hospitals that have loop clinics uh, that uh, will have primary care doctors or specialists that would deal in nephrology. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? One of the things, you know, when we talk about informed consent, um, one of the things that I find most often deficient in informed consent conversations, forms, all of it, is that we presuppose that people understand what science is. That's true. Okay? And, and we presuppose that they understand that the whole point of doing science is the fervent hope that in the comparison we're doing, 
one group will do significantly better than the other, the obverse of which is we hope fervently that one group will do significantly worse than the other. Mm -hmm. That is what science is in clinical research trials. And we don't get that across. We think of it in terms of, well, this might benefit you. No, it might accidentally benefit you, but no trial is designed to benefit any individual. Pure mm -hmm. luck if you happen to get in the group, which may or may not be the intervention group, that does significantly better, if anybody does better right. in, in the thing. And, and we simply lose track of, of helping people understand what science, science is. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, I, I, I spend um, some time, and that's towards the beginning of the discussion that I explain why we're doing what we're doing, and I, I, I try to get that point across um, when I do the informed consents. And then at the end, I ask again, so, um, so do you understand why we're doing this research, and what, uh, what is the, thing, the most important thing that we're trying to discover with this research? Also, an attorney who's had a child treated at St. Jude, and I always appreciated that someone from the research team came with the study to explain what it was. My daughter was 14 when she was diagnosed, and she understood that on protocol 15 for leukemia, there had been previous protocols where if you didn't have involvement in the spinal tap, they tried for the first time not radiating your brain, that caused a lot of problems. And that she could appreciate that some parent and family made a decision to withgo radiation on their brain to see if that was really necessary or not. That's a really scary study, but if she was benefited from that, by the time her protocol came along, she was not irradiated on the brain, and so she had less complications. The treatment was shorter, much better. So at 14, she thought it. It still does, thinks it's her mission to give back. So every study that came through the door, she'd ask, is it invasive, is it non-invasive, and she'd have a conversation. And she did her best to, and her sibling too, to do the studies, to give back, because she knew she was fortunate to have a research hospital that she could go to. Adults often, there's no research, you just treat treated with whatever, but you know, she thought it was her mission to do every study that she could, and they say her, uh, case files like phone books, like New York phone books. Like, so you're also dealing with a 14-year-old who wants to be allowed to make her own decisions. And I really appreciate the people that came into the room and talked it through and explained it. And it's amazing now because they pretty much follow them for a while. You bring up a, a good point, which is uh, when the participant is old enough to understand the research. So uh, we should be seeking the understanding from the the minor participant too, but it's interesting when we get to those situations, wasn't your daughter's case, but when the, the teenager says, I don't want, and the parent says, I want, so it, it gets really tricky, uh, or the other way around. I've, I've had the, both situations happening. And, and I will add to that for the, the lawyers and the law students in the room, we are in a state that goes by the rule of sevens, and so it is presumed that um, if, if a minor is 14, be, between 14 and the age of majority, that they are capable of consenting. And so in that clinical research environment, you do have to get their assent, um, which means that not necessarily they are the ones signing the consent form. It's still the parent generally who's signing the consent form, but that they understand what is happening and that they agree to go along with it. And if, if they if they don't agree, there needs to be a very serious discussion there, and that's that's usually when the lawyers would be um, called. But that does happen sometimes, that the parents want to move forward, and the teenager doesn't, and the teenager very much understands what is going on and says, you know, I, I feel I've been through enough. I don't want to go through that. Um, and, and those are really difficult conversations, but they're conversations that need to happen, and you need to be very honest with everybody involved. Thank you very much. We're out of time. We have a 15-minute break. I want to give a round of applause to our